This is session B3, Rutherford Model of the Atom, 1911. Last session, we covered Einstein's miracle year, 1905. Today, we're going to explore two topics, radioactivity half-life and Rutherford Model of the Atom from 1907 and 1911. It was Ernest Rutherford who was responsible for both. He was a New Zealander. He was a student of J.J. Thompson. The work on radioactivity half-life was conducted at McGill University in Montreal. Then he went to Manchester in England, and the Rutherford model of the atom work took place at Manchester. And then later he went to Cambridge University. Radioactivity was discovered in 1896. Marie Curie isolated radium in 1898. Marie Curie thought that radioactivity was due to the disintegration of atoms, and Rutherford believed that. We now know that there are stable nuclei and unstable nuclei and radioactivity, nuclear radioactivity is due to the decay of unstable nuclei. However, nuclei were not known until Rutherford's work in 1911 that we will cover today. Radioactive decay of a nucleus takes an atom of one element and it becomes an atom of a, of a different element along with the emission of some particle. It was Rutherford who determined that there were three kinds of emission, alpha radiation or particles, which he would prove would, would be high speed, high energy um, helium-4 nuclei. So having a charge of two and a, and a mass of four, four particles, and no electrons, uh, a charge of positive two from two protons. Beta radiation particles, which he was able to show were high-speed electrons, but now we know that there also are beta radiation of the antimatter particle of electrons, high-speed positrons and gamma rays, typically of higher energy than X-rays. In, in or around 1907, um, it was observed that the amount of radioactivity from a sample decreases over time, decreasing by half in a particular amount of time for some material. It's a little more complicated than that, but um, let's look at the exponential decay rate. If you have a large collection of identical atoms, not a single atom, then we can compute on average what's happening to the large sample. If we start with some initial number, N0, of undecayed, non-decayed atoms, the number that remain undecayed after time t will fall by half every decay half-life, which is called T one half. So after one half life of a large sample of atoms, on average, half of the atoms remain undecayed and half have decayed. After a second half life, one quarter remain undecayed, half times a half which means three quarters have decayed. 
this can equivalently be expressed as an exponential with a time constant, a decay time constant, tau. And tau is related to t1 half by this formula, which we're not going to be too worried about. Now, let's take this formula, the exponential part, and calculate a decay rate. If we take the derivative of this with respect to time, we get a minus 1 over tau factor. And, if we, and the decay rate is the negative of the time derivative of the amount remaining because it's, it's the, the atoms that don't remain that have decayed. And that decay rate will be the number remaining divided by tau. And since the number remaining decreases with time, the decay rate decreases with time, as Rutherford found. So Rutherford attributed this exponential uh, of how many atoms remain undecayed, he, he was able to show that that is appropriate for what they were observing for um, decay rates. Now, this can be expressed in terms of probability. The probability for an unstable nucleus to decay within, ha within its half-life is 50% on average. And the probability to decay per unit time is 1 over tau. But radioactive decay and probability to decay cannot be explained by classical physics. There are, there are things in complex macroscopic systems that have probabilities but we can't explain radioactive decay with classical physics. In macroscopic systems, you, let's say you have a gas that's in thermal equilibrium at some temperature. Each atom or molecule in the gas has some velocity and kinetic energy at some moment, and it has some probability of having some uh, given uh, kinetic energy at some moment. Um, that's a consequence of it being a large collection in thermal equilibrium. And, and we would still call that classical physics, th uh, thermodynamics. We can have metals that can have cracks and there will be a, a there can be a probability of a crack growing in some material such as the aluminum skin of an airplane or the probability of a particular metal part fatiguing and failing there's probability of earthquakes probability of slip of an earthquake fault there's probability in weather weather is a chaotic system small changes of conditions have big effects. But radioactive decay is, is not something we can explain with classical physics. However, exponential decay is, is easily explained in quantum mechanics. We won't do this, but it's the probability of tunneling through an energy barrier, which we may talk about in a future lecture. But the point is, not only can quantum mechanics explain probabilities, probability is essential to understanding quantum mechanical results and measurements. This is a possible time to take a break. Let's look at some examples. Nuclear decay half-lives range across 54 orders of magnitude from a small fraction of a second 
to 100 trillion times the age of the universe. This is for unstable nuclei. There also are stable nuclei um, that, as far as is known, would last forever. Um, so there's a broad range of half-lives, which means there's a broad range of radioactive decay rates. Some decays are so slow that they are hardly measurable uh, in a laboratory experiment. And others are so fast that they're, uh, they occur in a fraction of a second and then the, the nucleus is gone. Um, we're going to look at a couple examples, sort of mid-range. The mineral granite, uh, or the rock granite, uh, contains radioactive thorium, and it often contains radioactive uranium. Now, they have a half-life of like a billion years, which is why there is still thorium and uranium in granite where, you know, the lifetime, the Earth has been around for four point something billion years and a lot of the thorium and, and uranium have decayed, but a lot still remains undecayed. And so we can find it in an everyday material like granite. Granite is present in the Earth's crust. The, you can see it on the surface of the Earth. There are mountains of granite. Um, many houses are built on top of granite, um, granite being right underneath the topsoil or underneath a layer of clay that is underneath topsoil. Some people have granite kitchen countertops. But granite is radioactive to a small extent. And we're going to look at just one of the decay products of uranium-238. If you don't know about, um, so 238 is the uh, uh, atomic uh, weight, the, the total number of neutrons and protons in this particular isotope of uranium, which is the main isotope of uranium. But if you don't know that, don't worry about it. It's not important um, to, it's not important to today's uh, material. One of the, uranium-238 decays into, you know, some isotope which decays into another isotope and another one and there's a decay chain um, of daughter particles. We're only going to be interested in radium-226 which is in the decay chain of uranium-238. The decay of thorium produces a different isotope of radium. Radium-226's half-life is 1600 years the, the radium isotope from thorium has a shorter half-life. Now, so the half-life of uranium is more than a billion years, and one of its daughter particles, radium-226, has a half-life of 1,600 years. Now, 1,600 years might seem like a long time, but, but it's actually it's a good amount of time. It's long enough that we can extract this, this isotope of, ra of radium from uh, a sample of uranium because it, it, it has not decayed so quickly, so it still exists in the sample. So we can extract it and we can store it, but it's still radioactively active, whereas the thorium decay products are shorter-lived. so. We, we might be able to extract them, but we can't really store them for very long because they decay quickly. Now, 1,600 years, you might say, well, that's a long time. How much radioactivity is there? 
there's a lot. Um, we, we can detect the radioactivity in uranium-238 with a Geiger counter and for sure with radium-226. If we had a, a, a nanogram, a billionth of a gram, that would be on the order of three trillion atoms. And although the decay rate is, is uh, the, the half-life is long, there's so many atoms that there will be 37 decays per second while we still have a nanogram of radium-226. Another way to look at it is one part per million of, of that radium decays per day. So that's a good deal of, of radioactivity. Um, radium-226 emits alpha particles and it becomes radon-222, which is a gas. Radium is a solid, radon is a gas. Radon-222's half-life is 3.8 days. Much shorter. So if we had a, an even smaller sample of radon gas, 10 to the minus 15th grams, that would be like 3 million atoms. But the, the half-life is so small that that would be like 6 decays per second. So a, much, a, a millionth less radon is still producing about the same amount of decays, the same radioactivity as radium. Because radon is a gas and can be present in our houses, it is a significant risk for lung cancer. We can inhale radon gas. Radon is heavier than air, but we can inhale it. Um, it can be present in our cellars and basements that are built over granite. It's the second uh, leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. And because of that risk, you'll see houses with radon gas detectors in their basement and radon abatement and ventilation systems to remove that gas and put it in, in the air outside the home where it's of less risk. Radium and radon's half-life and alpha emission proved useful in Rutherford's experiments, including the 19, the experiments we're going to talk about in the remainder of this lecture. Now, one source of radioactivity in your home is smoke detectors. The most common kind of smoke detector, ionizing smoke detector, has a very small amount of a radioactive isotope, americium-241. Its half-life is 432 years. It's a very small amount, um, and americium is a, is a solid, not a gas. Um, so it's not a uh, um, hazard to your health. Um, In addition to nuclei, subatomic particles can also be stable or unstable. They decay with lifetimes ranging from a very small fraction of a second to 900 seconds. That does not include stable particles like the proton and the electron. The neutron is stable when it's in a nucleus with, with protons, but it's not stable outside of a nucleus where its lifetime is 900 seconds. This is a possible time to take a break. Next, we'll talk about Rutherford's model of the atom from 1911.
He was in Manchester for this work. Rutherford had two grad students, Geiger and Marsden. Geiger was German, but Rutherford was impressed by him and asked him to come work at Manchester. You may know the name Geiger from Geiger Counter, which uh, uh, Geiger will uh, later invent or co-invent. Geiger and Marsden created various experiments directed by Rutherford to try and discover the internals of an atom, how, how an atom is constituted. These experiments are sometimes also called the Rutherford gold foil experiments. Geiger and Marsden did the experiments and collected the results and Rutherford analyzed the results and um, gave them direction of how to improve the experiments. They had uh, different apparatuses over those five years. We're only going to look at one apparatus, the one that will give us the most insight. And that was from 1913. Now. 1913 is after 1911. What happened is their earlier experiments caused Rutherford to propose a model of the atom. And then their 1913 experiment was to try to confirm that model and it confirmed every aspect of that model. Here's the apparatus. The big circle is the wall of vacuum chamber. Within the vacuum chamber, there's a lead box with an alpha particle source. In this case, the alpha particle source is radon gas. But they also had other experiments where they used radium and radon gas and another radioactive material. The lead box makes it so that a a very large fraction of the alpha particles go from the box from left to right, which is shown by the, the bigger red arrow. The beam of, so um, the beam will be alpha particles from, from radon traveling at high speed, high energy, left to right. In the middle of the chamber is a, a very thin gold foil. They also did experiments with silver and other materials. Gold is of particular interest for two reasons. It's, it's a heavy, dense uh, metal, and it is the most ductile, malleable metal, which means it can be beaten and drawn into a very thin gold foil or a gold leaf. Their paper doesn't give the thickness of the gold foil um, in, in length units, um, but I believe it was about four microns thick, four millionths of a meter, which we now know would be two to three thousand atoms thick. This shows a microscope. So they could be outside the vacuum chamber and look through the microscope. And what they would look at is what I'm showing in green here is a fluorescent screen. If an alpha particle hit the screen, it would scintillate it or it would, it would, uh, show a uh, green uh, blip and they would look through the microscope in a darkened room they would look through it for hours and hours and count the uh, number of scintillations that they detected and record them the microscope and the outer ring of the chamber could rotate around the center 
so they could over many tests you know they could record the amount of uh, alpha particles hitting the fluorescent screen at different um, angles different scattering angles relative to passing clear through most by far most alpha particles went straight through and and we that's of interest to us why is that we will we will look at that a few were, de were deflected to small angles like this one or like that one very few but some were deflected to higher angles like this one or this one or even this one which is deflected more than 90 degrees so it it it's like it hit something and bounced back nobody was surprised that alpha particles went straight through we'll see why nobody was surprised by that but it was very surprising that any got deflected backward Rutherford said this is like firing uh, a 15 inch you know uh, naval uh, battleship shell at a piece of tissue paper and having it bounce back. It was that surprising that it happened. But it was Rutherford that had the insight to say, let's look for this. Because the original experiments, they, they only looked for here. And then when Rutherford saw this, he said, well, let's look broader. And then he said, let's even look for bounce backs. So he had the insight to say, even though it shouldn't happen, and even though there aren't very many that are even deflecting this far, let's look further and let's look for a long time and see if there are any. And there were. This is a possible time to take a break. Now, in 1904, J.J. Thompson had proposed three plausible or likely scenarios for what, how atoms could, uh, what, how, what atoms would consist of. And of the three, he had a, a, a favorite. And his, in his favorite, he said, the atoms of the elements consist of a number of negatively electrified corpuscles that we now call electrons, enclosed in a sphere of uniform positive electrification. They knew at that time that the electrons were small, essentially point particles, and that very little of the mass of the atom was in the electrons. So wh whatever was left after the electrons, which they knew had to ha have positive charge, whatever that was, that's almost all the mass of an atom. This came to be called um, the plum pudding model or the Christmas plum pudding model. I don't, I don't know if Thompson uh, wrote that in his paper, but it came to be called that, the plum pudding model. We'll explain that. Here in the U.S., we probably don't know what a Christmas pudding is and a plum pudding, but... Okay, in this drawing, an atom is these big circles with blue in them, so there's, I'm showing three atoms, one, two, three, and I'm showing them as touching. In, in Thompson's plum pudding model, the electrons, which I'm showing as brown circles, I'm showing them as big because if I show them too small, you won't be able to see the minus sign, but, act, but they're basically point particles, so they should actually be 
as small as it could draw them. They're presumably, or they might be free to move, or they might be fixed, but they're within a sphere of uniform positive charge. The thing is, it was expected that alpha particles would pass straight through this. Now, why is that? The alpha particles are positive. The the uh, the pudding, the, the the blue positive pudding of the plum pudding model should repel the uh, alpha particles. But it's spread over such a diffuse volume, a big enough volume, that the charge density is low. And so there will be some deflection, but very little deflection of, of the positive alpha particles. Now, what will happen if the alpha particle comes near an, a negative electron? The, uh, they will interact, they, they, they will attract. Won't the electrons be scattered to this angle and that angle and this angle? And, and won't the electrons hit the uh, fluorescent screen and, and uh, cause it to light up and get counted? Well, the alpha particles are mu have much more mass than the electrons. So if an electron interacts with, scatters off the alpha particle, the alpha particle has more mass and it's traveling at very high speed left to right. What will happen is those electrons will get scattered, almost all of them, straight to the right. And so they might be among the big red arrow on the right, but they're not really scattered at, at other angles very much. So the reason that Rutherford conducted this experiment with his grad students is they wanted to, Rutherford wanted to see, is the plum pudding model right? And almost all of the alpha particles did go straight through, but some got deflected at higher angles. And so Rutherford analyzed that and said, you know, that just uh, doesn't, doesn't analyze correct. So his analysis produced a different model in 1911. Oh, I should say that the sizes of atoms were roughly known by this time. We talked about Einstein and Brownian motion and, and that the sizes of atoms were known from gas experiments. So the sizes of atoms were roughly known. It was known that electrons were smaller, much smaller, and had insignificant fraction of mass. Um, so those were known. This is a possible time to take a break. Rutherford was able to explain the high deflection angles, like this one and like this one, by supposing that all of the atoms positive charge and almost all of the atoms mass were located in small dense nuclei that I'm showing as these little blue dots at presumably the center of the atom and the electrons were still in the atom and, and spread out among the size of the atom. Whether they were moving or fixed wasn't, no, wasn't known. The, the breakthrough in the Rutherford model is being able to identify a small dense nucleus of positive charge and almost all the mass of the atom. And he produced equations that showed how much scattering would be expected at different angles. And we will look at that. So in my diagram here, the little blue dot is the nucleus. The brown circles are the electrons. But 
they are basically point particles. The nucleus is not a point particle, but it's so small that it you could think of it as nearly a point particle. So what is the gray sphere? Well, that's just the location that the electrons are in, but it's not a solid. So this atom is adjacent to this atom and adjacent to this atom, but they're not solid boundaries. They're the locations of the electrons but not a solid where like they would have been in the plum pudding model. Now, one thing to notice about the Rutherford model is if the alpha particle comes very close to a positive nucleus, it'll be scattered at a high angle. It could be scattered forward, it could be scattered backward. But because the nucleus is so small compared to the size of the atom, most of the alpha particles will go right through a single atom and in fact go right through the gold foil of that's two to three thousand atoms thick. So the alpha particles can scatter to high angles, can be deflected to high angles when they happen to be clo come close to the nucleus. But almost all the alpha particles will not come close to a nucleus. Just they will go through space where the nucleus isn't and they will come straight through as the results showed. So in 1911, Rutherford analyzed this and said, if all of an atom's positive charge and almost all of its mass are concentrated in a small point-like nucleus, and if that nucleus is more massive, much more massive than the alpha particle, then it'll be the alpha particle that deflects, not the nucleus. And remember, the electrons are not going to be deflected to high angles because they they are less massive than the alpha particle, which is traveling at high speed, left to right. So under those circumstances, his formula predicted he had a formula for the number of deflected alpha particles and the scintillations that could be observed per minute on the screen at a given deflection angle, phi, and he found that it should be proportional to a trigonometric function of the angle which decreases strongly with angle. So the number deflected at 90 degrees or past 90 degrees is going to be very small but still finite and measurable. He said that the uh, scintillations per minute observed should be proportional to the thickness of the thin foil, the square of the magnitude of the charge of the nucleus, and one over the square of the alpha particle's kinetic energy. In 1913, Geiger and Marsden used their new setup, the one that we looked at, conducted experiments using that setup and some other setups, and proved all four of these relationships. So it was believed that the Rutherford model was correct. The nucleus is a small, dense concentration of all the positive charge and almost all the mass of an atom. For their experiments, Geiger and Marsden won the Nobel Prize. Rutherford had already won the Nobel Prize earlier for his experiments in radioactivity. They, know, they knew and we, we know that atom sizes are on the order of an angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters. And 
their experiments showed that the now uh, Rutherford's model was for a nucleus that was uh, a point particle so much smaller than the atom we now know that nuclei sizes are on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters so a hundred thousand times smaller than the radius of, of an atom and so the volume of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 times the volume of an atom now in in Thompson's 1904 paper he he proposed three models for the atom the one that he liked best was what we ended up calling the plum pudding model and we analyzed that but one of his other two was a small dense positive nucleus with surrounded by electrons but he knew and said well this is impossible with classical physics the electrons can't just stand still they're attracted to the positive nucleus they should collapse onto the positive nucleus and the atom size should be you know zero it should collapse well what if the electrons orbited the nucleus well if it they orbited they would be moving in a circle they would be accelerating they would have centripetal acceleration they are charged so that acceleration of a charged particle would would uh, radiate energy which means their orbit would get smaller and smaller in fact they would decay onto the nucleus in you know less than a billionth of a second so now that Rutherford has shown that there is a very small dense positive nucleus and the Rutherford model couldn't say what what the electrons do but the electrons must do something because the atom has a large size compared to the nucleus we need to know why don't the electrons collapse onto the nucleus as classical physics say they must and that'll be the topic of our next session, the Bohr model, uh, in 1913. Another good question is, why don't atoms collapse together? If atoms aren't solid, couldn't they collapse together? And quantum mechanics will explain that. We won't cover that in any uh, uh, in any of our uh, next sessions. And that's the end of B3.